Well, hi, friends. Welcome back to How to Eat an Elephant. I am your host, Ian, joined today by Emily and Megan, as usual, for what is a consummation. Oh. Oh! <laughs> oh, no, no, no! Hey, I'm allowed to use the word if you go use the word, okay? Come on now. This is, in fact, what we get to see. That Well, we don't get to see that part. Goodness gracious. No. We, see the, we see a wedding. At long last, there's a wedding. And I think it's a really fascinating section because... It is such mingled sorrow and joy, which may indeed have something to do with Hugo's thematic emphasis over the whole novel. So I'm excited to discuss that with you. But first of all, how are the two of you doing and how did you manage to stop reading at the end of our session for this week? People are put a scene in Facebook about how they just didn't. They're, they're done waiting for us. They just like, went ahead. You, like, guys you do know what, you, what? you suckers. We're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard for me too. Uh, well, I can't believe that we're only, this is like our second to last official episode i mean we have other episodes scheduled for wrapping up but like this is the this is the beginning of the end. second to last reading section yeah yeah i mean let's just contrast for a second this is roughly of the same length as war and peace and we did it in what half the time yeah is it fully half <laughs> yeah we were flying we have been cooking right along we're well it's a combination you guys of us flying this time and us crawling last time <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty slow War and Peace was pretty slow. <laughs> Our audio editor alone wanted to kill himself at how slow we went last time. <laughs> hmm. I think that this book is actually longer than War and Peace. Is it? I don't know. I mean, the print is very, very tiny, so it's hard to compare. It's more pages than War and Peace. But the pages are smaller, but the print is smaller. So how did, I don't know. Who knows? You know? Hmm. I don't know. Okay, so I'm confused. I confess myself confused on the outset of this reading. He sets us up to be talking about Marius and Cosette's wedding, and then spends a big long, a good long time talking about Mardi Gras in Paris. Mm. And I don't understand the connection. So help me. What is going on here? Why are we talking about Mardi Gras in Paris? I mean, I think yeah, it's a great question. He definitely draws attention to it, and we're given like a couple different takes on the fact that they're getting married on Mardi Gras. The grandfather thinks it's a good thing. I, I mean, he gives them yeah. the option to like back out, right? Because he wants to get married on Mardi Gras. But then there's like a proverb. He says, marriages on Mardi Gras produce no ingrate brats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Then. But like, I wonder if that has to do with um, the fact that it's the entrance into the Lenten season. So, um, oh. it's a it's a joyous occasion that uh, is actually a preparation for a time of uh, grieving. Yeah, yeah, grieving, hmm. uh, uh, asceticism. Hmm. It doesn't seem to make any sense, given that they're on their way into marriage, right? And then the, the descriptions that'll follow that are very glowing. But it might make sense for Valjean. Well, right. It makes sense for Hugo to have done this. But are you saying, Ian, it makes less sense for Cosette, for example, to say, what a great day for my wedding. Yeah, let's have a wedding on this day. And then right. let's, I don't know, try and be ascetics during our first well, month of being married. That isn't. I mean, there, it actually might temper the overdrawn nature of the wedding in that, like, so it's it's a festival uh it's a joyous occasion but what comes next is reality right and and mm -hmm. this is hugo goes at length and we'll have to talk about what this means but he goes at length to tell us that this marriage is where the ideal and the real touch mm -hmm. and, like meet each other yeah right but, like they this is like none of this has been real life for them like they're floating on a cloud and now they're going to get married and like I don't know. Anyone who's been married knows that like, that's when the work begins, right? That's certainly mm -hmm. true. On the other hand, they are getting married as the newly minted Baron and Baroness with well. 30,000 francs a year. I mean, <laughs> they have, there's, there's a sentence that literally says they have everything, including money. I mean, like, I know there are other ways to suffer besides being poor, even though we cannot understand that <laughs> <laughs> that's true but i think oh. i guess what i'm trying to say is that there's a, there's some literary shorthand for these two Don't people are experiencing luck beyond the measure of mere mortals 
I mean, isn't there also a line where he talks about God selecting people to um, to mm-hmm. make their dreams come true? And he yeah. says that God had selected Marius and Cosette. So I think I like the parallel with Mardi Gras being the start of the Lenten season. But if that's going to have thematic resonance, I think it has to be not for Marius and Cosette, but for Valjean. I don't know, though, because the top of page 1364 The uh, grandfather says, let's go this way. These young folks are marrying. They're going to enter on the serious things of life. It will prepare them for it to see a bit of the masquerade. Yeah. Do you think it's ironic or serious? This wedding is heralding a hard season for you. Get ready to be serious. I think it's, no, I think You think that's that's even given his speech later where he's going to do his thing again about- Well, and I think- Ascending to Elysian fields of bliss? I think it has to be both and. I think maybe a wedding is. Because well, in I this agree. reading, we're pairing, <laughs> <laughs> we're pairing. Um, I don't. The two major movements of the passage we read for today are the grandfather saying, "Happiness is everything. Be jubilant," mm-hmm. and then Jean Valjean saying, "It's not enough to be happy. I must be satisfied with myself as well." So yeah. there's mm-hmm. like it's like this pair. It's like this Easter joy paired with the Lenten. Uh, Mm -hmm. gravity and they're just it's both end at the same time and Marius and and Cosette have thus far represented the joy but there I mean even even in this section we get that little passage where Marius is talking to Jean Valjean and Cosette like wants to come and hang out with them and Marius has to get serious with her and be like no you're not like you're not allowed here and he has to kind of put his foot down and there's <laughs> like he's never done that with her before that's true it's a shade condescending and annoying but well yes yeah, certainly but, but, true well, the whole yeah. thing was kind well, of and he's doing yeah. it for the sake of he's doing it for the sake of valjean too in that moment but okay but she was also this? being I, a total b <laughs> i like i like the discussion i like the points that you're making i just am i i'm not through with my question yet because how about this page 1371 the grandfather is talking to Valjean and he says, there must be no more sadness anywhere from now on. By Jove, I decree joy. Evil has no right to exist. That there are unfortunate men, that's truly a disgrace to the blue sky. Evil does not come from man who's basically good. All human miseries have hell for their capital and headquarters, otherwise known as the Tuileries of the devil, or however you say that. Well, here I am making speeches again. As for me, I no longer have any political opinions. For men to be rich, that is to say happy, that's all that I ask. It's hard for me to see the grandfather telling them that there are serious realities of life coming in anything but a mocking way. No, it, it's a picture of heaven. It's a it's a glimpse yeah. of something to come. And it, with uh, Hugo, much as with Tolstoy, the political is always intertwined in there. There's a, there's one sentence in the passage that you read that I'm sure that we'll talk about more that makes you go, ah. But like on the whole, the speech is meant to be a joyous portrait of what should be Hmm. Hmm. i this may be completely unfounded and i don't know if i can find a way to express it that's helpful but this tone of the grandfather reminded me of angel ross a little bit Hmm. like you know how angel ross is a representative yeah he's like an angel and he's Uh a representative of virtue and it's not really associated with any political statement. It's there for its own sake. Right. And here the grandfather, for the first time in the whole story, steps away from political opinions that he has been espousing and instead says, I the, the greatest good is happiness, happiness mm-hmm. for all men. I don't know that it's practically applicable, but he's stepping away from the world of practical things. He's not trying to be practical. He's He's jubilant in a, I don't know, in a heavenly sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Of course, the complication with Mardi Gras is that we don't just get the jubilant side. Hugo also gives us a portrait of the seedy underbelly mm-hmm. of Mardi Gras uh, with these these uh, wagons that are going by full of people. Who have <laughs> wagons intended to... for six people that have 20 people in them. It's yeah. Like tottering it's along. Like a, it's a... Um, Let's see, there's a great line where he says, there should be no festival for the hordes unless the police exhibit among them this sort of 20-headed hydra of joy. Yeah. Uh, that there's a way in which the, this is the way that the authority figures keep the population down. They give mm-hmm. them these these times of 
uh Saturnalian um, Bacchanals. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then as a result, um and the people want it. It says uh Paris, we must admit, willingly accepts comedy through infamy. She demands of her masters when she has masters, but one thing, dab a little makeup on the mud. Yep. Rome was mm-hmm. of the same humor. She loved Nero, and Nero was a titanic lighterman. Yep. So the, there's like this unhealthy codependency mm-hmm. between the people and the authorities that's yeah. uh, leading to bad patterns. Well, and there's a contrast too, I think, in the in the in Hugo's style, the way he discusses these, because th- they're parallel scenes, right? There's the Mardi, the Mardi Gras and the description of that revel, and then there's the wedding feast at uh, yeah. the grandfather's house and the yeah. description of that revel, and he uses a lot of similar terminology both directions, and one of the things I noticed was laughter is present in both as a defining yeah. characteristic, but the laughter at Mardi Gras is this, too cynical to be frank, mm-hmm. and in fact, suspect. It has a mission to show off the carnival to the Parisians, Right. So there's some kind of there's a way in which the laughter of Mardi Gras is um, frantic or brittle mm-hmm. or not full. And the laughter well, of the wedding feast is. Yep. I think it's funny because they're actually there are two figures who are masked, who we discover who they are. And I'll tell you in just a second. But they're talking about the nature of a wedding. Mm-hmm. And they they realize that Cosette and Marius is bridal party is going by and they're like oh look it's a wedding and they say it's a sham wedding we're the real thing mm. and i think that's the the concept of a celebration that's valid and a celebration that's empty are side mm. by side and there's they're both masked because it's mardi gras yep. but you're trying to figure out where's the real joy and where's the empty one the one that's just yeah. sort of a i don't know a play for the people bread for the masses kind of a thing if they're being married, they're being married to their misery. Mm-hmm. Even the way that he, the image he uses to set up that scene, right? There's um, the street has carriages going in both directions. And one in one direction, the wedding party is, is going yep. and then headed back the other direction. But parallel is the uh, Mardi Gras carnival. There's a, they're headed in opposite directions opposite but they're directions. still along the same track hmm. well those two masked people who are having a conversation it seems to me were Tenardier, who has been missing for some crucial chapters and his only surviving offspring whose name i cannot remember what is her name Azelma. yeah azelma yes so azelma is is dressed up as a prostitute in this scene and is very clearly acting the part but he wants her to go instead and follow Jean Valjean, who he recognizes with his arm in a black sling. But again, as always, Hugo does not say it was Jean Valjean. Right then, he believes he's pulled the wool over our eyes. There was this mysterious <laughs> guy who he describes exactly like he has always described Jean Valjean. But his arm was in a sling, and I wonder why these people are following him. The chapter heading of the very next mm-hmm. chapter is Jean Valjean still has his arm in a sling. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I thought this was funny. I think Hugo is... <laughs> He thinks he's subtler than he is. I, the chapter headings are funny. Like that's what, whenever he's like super serious, it's just he lightens the mood with, he acknowledges the overblown romanticism in just the like cutting, deflating yeah. titles that he puts on his chapters. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get this, the description of Marius and Cosette on the day of their wedding and how they look at one another and what's going through their minds was almost as uncomfortable to read for me as his description of Cosette in her virginal uh, chambers boudoir. from a few, yeah. yeah, in her boudoir from a few, <laughs> few episodes ago. I just feel like he keeps looking at us and saying, I won't, but I must. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about when the when the, the wedding night is finally upon us, he talks about an oh, angel no. that stands at the door. And here we stop. On the threshold of wedding night stands an angel smiling, a finger to his lips. And I'm like, that angel is you, bro. <laughs> the old lech. <laughs> <laughs> He's just standing there, <laughs> just picking up to the corner of his mouth. Oh yeah, <laughs> woo! And this, it's also they are. What What do you guys think about this? They seem to be. Um. We've gotten enough details about Marius in his personality, in his struggles at the barricade, in in his war with his grandfather, all these things, <laughs> for him to be a real figure. 
but the way that Hugo describes both of them on this day and in this context zooms back out again into mm-hmm. some kind of ideal type. I know. Yeah. Well, I think they are a type. They're the marriage feast of the lamb. That's their type. Mm. Oh, well, I can't be silly now. That's such a good point. That is a really good point. <laughs> I mean, Megan, it's... just look at the phrase nuptial pillow. Now you can be silly again. <laughs> it's back. It's back. <laughs> <laughs> Silliness is back. <laughs> um, I was going to, I was just laughing because what we were arguing about at the beginning of this episode is, um, oh, oh no, I'm losing my train of thought. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Hold on. Do you remember how at the beginning of our episode, we were talking about the reality of uh marriage and yet the the beautiful divine moment that it is it's Mm -hmm. it was strange that it was going to be on mardi gras because this seems to be like kicking off of the lenten season and and difficulty and hard hard reality right Mm -hmm. well listen to this little section about cosette and marius and the way that they see each other and think of that okay they did not see each other they contemplated one another (laughs) cosette beheld marius in a glory Marius beheld Cosette on an altar, and on that altar and in that glory, the two apotheoses mingling in the background, mysteriously behind a cloud to Cosette, in a flashing flame to Marius, there was the ideal, the real, the rendezvous of kiss and dream, the nuptial pillow. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so are they in for a rude awakening? If you can honestly say of the person you are about to marry, I do not see you. I only see an ideal. Are you in for a rude awakening? Yes, but what I heard when you read that was the fire, the pillow, pillar of fire and the pillar mm. of, of cloud. That there, God is hidden in the pillar. Yeah. And uh, it, if this is the ideal and the real touching, it's like mm-hmm. heaven touching earth in this moment. And they're about to descend all the way to earth. And they it's going to yeah. be hard for them to see heaven again. Yeah, That's the problem. Ex- I, I, well, I think he holds out hope. I think you're probably right, Emily, but I do think he's a little bit rosier about it than all that. Um, I mean, he's aware that these are young lovers. Um, like this sentence down here, such a day is an ineffable mixture of dream and certainty. You possess and you conjecture. You still have some time before you for imagination. Right? So that's certainly true. And I can I can see what you're saying in that in that passage. Like, this isn't going to be exactly what they assume it is. But I also Mm -hmm. think that in the voice of the grandfather, he says, whatever this is, it's the most important thing going on full stop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So throw yourself into it, be deliriously happy and, and do whatever it takes to remain deliriously happy Mm -hmm. because that's the most important thing in the world. And the result of the ideal and the real touching in this moment is uh, an effusion of happiness that spills out onto everyone around them. And that can can be nothing but a good thing, right? There's right. joy in the passersby, even if they don't know the, um, the couple personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's jump into the grandfather's speech. And he says lots and lots and lots of things. No doubt we could comment on all of them. But mm-hmm. one of the things that stuck out to me was be a religion to each other. Everyone has his own way of worshiping God. The best way to worship God is to love your wife. I love you. That is my catechism. Whoever loves is orthodox. Hmm. So do you think this is the grandfather who is mingling truth with with his own particular version of exaggeration and hyperbole? Or is this Hugo? Is this what the the writers of the musical were... um, crystallizing when they wrote, to love another right person now. is to see the face of god i'm disappointed in you you could have sung that <laughs> <laughs> what do you think um that's a good question it reminds me of our discussion of tolstoy and i think i've said this before i mean I, we always talk about tolstoy but that's not what i mean what i mean is the part where he says uh love is god instead of god is love oh there's this danger like uh, and especially in the romantic period, it's really easy to conflate and there's a confusion there. Um, to have the other person be a religion is obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> we uh, <laughs> Americans of the Puritan tradition are like idolatry. But like, I do think there's also an aspect in which this might draw out the marriage feast imagery that like, to to worship god is to love your wife love your wife like christ loved the church like uh-huh. um and whoever loves is orthodox i mean that's john right the 
Well, yeah, especially in the sense that in order to love like he's suggesting, you have to be a fool about it. Mm. And that that's, that's humble. That's, um, that isn't, uh, that isn't anything but a human being exhibiting their foibles. Speaking of which, I love the line uh, where he says, ask this demagogue of Amarius if he is not the slave of this little tyrant of a Cosette and with Mm -hmm. his full consent, the coward woman there is no robespierre who holds out woman reigns uh, i'm no longer a royalist except for that royalty so he's even oh, keep um, reading. what is adam he is the realm of mm, eve mm. i love that line no 89 for Le- eve yeah no uh yeah. revolution needed for eve so it transcends and of course the grandfather has always stood for uh, an anti-revolutionary perspective but here there's some truth to what he's saying. I'm thinking that that Hugo is allowing him to say, you know, uh, all the politics that we've been discussing in this novel, they're real. That's part of the earthly condition. But in marriage, uh, we see something that transcends the need of like the tyrant rules and and is, um, I don't know, it's a, it's an upside down world in which there's no Robespierre necessary. Right. Mm. So yeah, it does require a humility, I guess is where I was making the connection, the the humility of the subject before the tyrant. Okay. Yes, I like all of this. I don't think, however, <laughs> that the grandfather is Hugo's voice in its entirety. I don't I either. He's, I think he's still yeah, no, there a are... peacocking character, and I get it from Well, him. because he goes directly from talking about woman in the in the beautiful Edenic sense to talking about woman like a womanizer, which his character is, right? Oh yeah. He's, oh, 100%. He, yeah, he's worshiping at, at the altar of womankind and all of woman's yeah. fascinating foibles, etc. Like a too, if anyone man. wanted to marry me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But but there's all, but then there's this too. And I think so your comment extends to his thoughts about God though. And I don't think his thoughts about God are exactly Hugo's. It's impossible to imagine God has made us for anything but this. To idolize, to coo, to plume, to be pigeons, to be cocks, to bill with our loves from morning to night, to take pride in our little wives, to be vain, to be triumphant, to put on airs. That is the aim of life. And I think there's a little current of wholesome truth about what it is to be young and in love and newly Mm -hmm. married. But also, though, it's a bald statement about the image of God in man that I think Hugo, Hugo has more to say than that. He does have more to say than that. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Although I, I think here we're getting a picture of the ideal and in the next chapter he turns to discussing the real. And he does it in the case of Valjean. Right. Right. Which is kind of what I was saying about Mardi Gras earlier. That if it does have the connotation of preparing us for a Lenten season, it's doing it for Valjean in terms of the story's imagery. Yeah. And I, I think Megan and I were just saying, yes, we agree with you. And then also it extends to just the principle of the thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have anything to say about the wedding night? I think that that <laughs> I don't know that anyone could top the picture of Hugo himself standing dressed like an angel with his <laughs> pinky to his lips outside the nuptial chambers. <laughs> Maybe we leave him right there, you know? Yeah. Although I did love the idea of um of a of a the consummation of a marriage being something that um, the angels witness and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Approve of or ratify, or there's a, there's a line about the angels envying the children of men Hmm. because of the experience that they've been given of salvation and of intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though the angels are not fallen, there's still something to envy about man station and i think he was echoing that here oh yeah that, i found it, was it really just now. it was really pretty to me perfect happiness is... implies the solidarity of the angels yeah mm-hmm. that obscure little alcove has for its ceiling the whole heavens when two mouths made sacred by love draw near each other to create it is impossible that above that ineffable kiss there should not be a thrill in the immense mystery of the stars that that's beautiful. just beautiful man so, there's romanticism for you it's freaking gorgeous Okay, so on to Valjean. Things are about to get less pretty and more sad. 
some of the to to kind of lead into following chapters and the chapters we've already been discussing there are some images of things like so he has his hand in a sling because he supposedly smashed his thumb as a result there's language like uh um Miss Monsieur Gilnormand now has to take his place mm -hmm. uh in, in signing the documents because he is her legal guardian and like right. Uh, at the wedding feast, when when he leaves, Marius assumes his, his chair. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, taking his place. There's a lot of language of Jean Bon <laughs> of Jean Bon Ben Bon <laughs> Bon John Jovi Bing Bong. Who we're now <laughs> who we're now calling Jean Valjean <laughs> Bing Bong Bing Bong. Bing bong. <clears throat> <laughs> if only knew how many hours I have been on Zoom recently. Yeah. Uh, we do. We're here with you. <laughs> I. What was I saying? Oh, uh, Jean Valjean is being. He's his place is being usurped. <laughs> that was not <laughs> such was a great anticlimax. I love statement. that you put it. I love that you put it that way because on the one hand, that is <laughs> objectively so. He is no longer Cosette's guardian. Marius is because he has given her away in marriage. However, he does it to himself. Well. Yes. In this passage, in a way that I want to talk about, because on the one hand, I have a lot of respect for Valjean in his inability to live a lie. I think we're supposed to respect him for that. Marius does, and the author does as well. On the other hand, he's drawing a ton of conclusions about how people that love him are going to respond to this revelation and putting himself intentionally on the outside um, and passing a judgment on his worthiness that I don't think the reader could possibly agree with. What do you guys think? Well, I agree. Well, I had the same impulse while I was reading. I was frustrated with him for basically playing God and saying, right. this is the way that this is the right way because it's the way that would make me miserable. That was my first take as I was reading it. I thought that was arrogant on his part. And I didn't mm. think it was necessary that he punished himself to this extent. But then in the section, it's chapter four, immortal, <laughs> no idea how to pronounce that word. It's liver. Jikor. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that does not clarify things for me, but I'm glad to know that. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> immortal <laughs> liver. What? Okay. Sorry. Continuing on. In the beginning of that chapter, uh, his wrestle with himself is described this way. The formidable old struggle, several phases of which we have already seen, began again. Jacob wrestled with the angel for one night only. So that scene in the Bible, Jacob wrestling with the angel, Jacob's wrestling with, I mean, many scholars believe an angel, maybe even Jesus, right? right. So some Christological figure, some heavenly figure is wrestling with a man to pin him to the ground and make him do the right thing. Well, and the topic is uh, give me a name. Right. Yes. Yes. Ian, yeah, that's yes, good. That's exactly what's going yeah. on here. He's right that to, and you know, he maybe should have named himself a long time ago because he, what he has done, if we are criticizing him, what he has done is prevent other people from having all the information to make a fully yeah, rounded to make a judgment, judgment about him. I like that. Yeah. That helps. But, um, but in as much as his reasoning goes here, now that it's too late for any of that, he is right that mm -hmm. uh to to foist himself on this he would be living a lie every single day right and he, right now he's just choosing not to live the lie anymore i can't argue with that i want to yeah, but that's I can't. good mm -hmm. that's good i mean i just yeah. it's hard not to feel like he's overlooking some very obvious and supernatural acts of provision like he's assuming that the end result of all of this will be that he is alone and bereft for the rest of his days and he's been sort of holding off that reality as long as possible meanwhile the things that have gone on in the last 10 chapters have completely freed him the government assumes that he's dead javert is dead i mean there's there's absolutely no reason that any of the people that would come back and try and punish him for these crimes would even know that he's still alive. Well, that's Marius's argument, right? They argue at length about this very thing. Why Why would Jean Valjean do this right now? It's no longer necessary. Right, but let's leave Marius out of this for just a second because Marius's response I also don't agree with. There are some things up with which I will not put and the way Marius immediately <laughs> starts things. thinking of Jean Valjean bothers the heck out of me. Let's talk about Jean Valjean's response to all of this. He knows 
that no one is coming looking for him. Right. He doesn't want to live a lie, which we've already said. Respectable, right? Yeah. Reveal your true self. However, he has apparently no faith in either Marius, which might be justified, or Cosette, maybe which is not, not justified. justified. Yeah. Right? No faith in their ability to square this revelation of a two-decade-old crime for which he was frankly kind of unjustly imprisoned with the legacy of provision and kindness and Christianity, to be frank, that he has demonstrated before Cosette's eyes. But okay. Can... Sorry, go ahead. Nemo. No, no. Go ahead. He also uses the language, though, when he's thinking about Cosette, of her being like a raft in a shipwreck. And he is choosing not to use her that way anymore. And I do approve of that. You know, he's clinging to her like, um, well, like a life preserver. And he's choosing not to not to rely on her for his happiness or a sense of security or any of the things that she has inadvertently given to him for years and years. And that seems that seems accurate. If they're ever going to have a, a successful future as an extended family, that dynamic is going to need to come into the light. And she's going to need to show him that she loves him in a healthy way, you know? And he's going he to deny her the tools to do that. Well, well right. I, You're saying he's not giving her any of the tools to do that. Right. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He is yeah. now. I guess that's what I was trying to say before. Like he, he maybe should have done that a long time ago, but he didn't. And so he is now, and he is, he's not actually, he, unlike the musical, he's not actually trying to remove himself entirely from their lives. He's just confessing the truth. And Only then, to her husband, whom he begs not to tell Cosette. Yes. Yeah. So yes, no, he isn't. Well, okay, not to her. You do have a point. Still You're not right. to her. I do think that's the heart of the issue, though. I'm not upset with him for, for bringing all this into the light. Me I either. think that he's right about it. It's yep. the only way to freedom is to tell the truth at last. But I wish that he would do it to the one who belongs to him in this right. scenario. You know, right. like mm -hmm. to his yeah, very well, own he daughter. Also, even after all of the unlooked for provision, after mm -hmm. the way that that since he met the bishop, God has been a constant actor in his life and has removed him from difficulty at every turn. Even still, he believes that to stick around with Cosette. And I don't think this is true just in the presence of this lie. I think that even if he had told the truth to stick around and partake in Cosette and Marius's happiness is impossible for him because he's fundamentally on the outside of society because he was once a convict. He even says as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not a human being like the two of you are. And that doesn't square with, with his experience of, of God, of forgiveness, of anything. But I just, we are really led to respect his decision and the wrestling scene mm -hmm. is really gorgeous. And especially as we get, um, I mean, first of all, he lays down on his bed in a cruciform <laughs> position. Yeah. Uh, once again, reminding us that Jean Valjean is our Christ figure. Uh, and then he he's thinking about his options like he did the night when he confessed who he was and saved the man from going to prison for him. Mm -hmm. And it says, if he clung to it, like like Megan was saying, the to Cosette as his raft, if he clung to it, he escaped disaster. He rose again into the sunshine. He let the bitter water drip from his garments and his hair. He was saved. He lived. If he let go, then the abyss. Javert comes to mind immediately. He's looking into the abyss and he does it again when he's, that is echoed when he's talking to Marius. Um, he has his arms crossed over his chest and it looks like he wants to create an abyss in the floor is what Hugo says. Mm -hmm. hmm. And it's topsy turvy because we say, well, yeah, man, don't go into the abyss. Choose to be saved. Except for this whole book is about descending into the abyss. And Jean Valjean's purpose is to descend into hell and come back, right? He said, "What?" there's a great line where he says, um, he explains himself to Marius and says that to duty is going into hell, but knowing that God is right there beside you. Yeah, and or the, the best part is the very end of book six, when he wait, finally wait, no, stirs yeah. up after, do you, do you want to say this instead? Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. You have a comment about it? Um, I'll cut in in just a second. Okay, so the at the very end of book six, uh, he has 
wrestled all the night through with what to do. And it says, then one saw that he was alive. What one? Since Jean Valjean was alone and there was nobody there. The one capitalized who was in the darkness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it's a descent into hell in search of a God who is present even there, or maybe even a God who is present most acutely Mm -hmm. there. Yes. What do you think, Megan? No, that's what I thought too. I do think Hugo's joking still, though, a little bit around the edges. Marius entered, his head erect, his mouth smiling, an indescribable light upon his face, his forehead radiant, his eye triumphant. He, too, had not slept. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Okay. If you say so, Hugo. If you say so. Oh, okay. So I do. Would you guys, do you want to talk about Marius's response? Well, I think he's a butthead. Can we start there? Yeah, we can (laughs) take it away, Bacon. Well, I don't know if I can take it anywhere. I'm just annoyed. I think that, um, to have someone that formerly you have respected and a moment before he's made this shocking revelation, you were basically throwing open the doors of your home and your heart and your family and your future. And you were so excited to have this guy in particular in your family. And then he reveals something unprompted. He did not have to do this. He reveals it to you and you basically agree with him with his self-assessment and and seek to cast him out as fast as you can. That is not, that is just not admirable. I do not, I do not respect Marius in this scene at all. Yeah. Is there more depth to be drawn out of his character here? Or is he really a one-dimensional, self-absorbed, easily led guy cotton-headed well, ninja aren't we kind of led to believe that he's been conditioned by the society to view convicts this way and, and yes. in some ways that's unavoidable we are except that i reject that too because he has been trying to condition himself to stand against society with a bunch of rebels for this entire book for thousands of pages yeah i know i and did he's find done it a ironic crap job he is actually thinking for himself in any way he's a convict too Mm. He he just stood on a barricade and defied the government. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. If there is any justification to Marius, it's this that he mistakenly believes that Jean Valjean shot took Javert out and shot him in the alley. That's true. And that's the one thing that he needs to have squared away, probably. And also, he I has just, no idea what Jean Valjean did for him. Right. This is the frustrating thing. He didn't ask any questions. Yeah. I mean, Marius well, did not ask any of the necessary questions. He's mad himself about that, too, to be fair. He is? Well, show me that scene. What, did I read yeah. too fast? Was it was <laughs> anger blurring my vision? Well, it almost <laughs> blurred mine. I had to slow down. Yeah, it starts in Chapter 2 of Book 7. Marius was completely overwhelmed. And then it goes on. I'm trying to find exactly where it is. I didn't, under, I didn't underline it. But he he discusses at length how... He didn't ask any questions. Um, let's see. There we go. 1409. We must remember and even emphasize that though he had questioned Jean Valjean to such an extent that Jean Valjean had said to him, you are confessing me. Marius had not, however, asked him two or three decisive questions. In other words, he questioned him, but not really. Jean Valjean just came and talked at him for a while. And all these questions happened in his mind. Not that they had not occurred to him, but he was afraid of them. The Jondrette Garrett, the barricade, Javert. Who knows where the revelations would have stopped? Valjean did not seem the man to shrink. And who knows whether Marius, after having urged him on, would not have desired to restrain him. But then he goes on to ask about his own character in this. Um, Let's see. He thought he had been too good, too mild, let us say the word, too weak. This weakness had led him to an unwise concession. He'd allowed himself to be moved. He'd done wrong. He should have simply cast him off. Jean Valjean was the Jonah. (laughs) The Jonah. The Jonah. Jonah. (laughs) He should have done it (laughs) and relieved his house of the man. He was vexed with himself. He was vexed with the abruptness of the whirl of emotions that had deafened, blinded, and drawn him on. He was displeased with himself. Yeah. Okay, Marius. (laughs) I, I just feel like we can't skip over uh, Jean Valjean's confession here. He says he's confessing to Marius. Uh, and just this whole novel, his identity has been in flux. He's always mm-hmm. assuming a different name. 
And here, even though everything is fine, even though all has gone his way and there's nothing really standing in his way except for his conscience, uh, he has, is choosing to assume his own name. He says, uh, Fauchelevent lent me his name. I have no right to use it. He could give it to me. I could not take it. A name is a me. Down below, he says, to live, I once stole a loaf of bread. Today to live, I will not steal a name. That's just so, so powerful. It is. Really, really it's powerful. gorgeous. And, to, and Marius can tell in the moment. You don't need this name to live, he says on the very next line. So I think, I don't know. I am frustrated with Marius as well. I think the 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 thing that frustrates me is something that Hugo calls out. He says, everything in Marius is latent progressivism. But he's mm -hmm. not as progressive now as he will be later. And so he's, he like you said, is conditioned to look at convicts as outside of society in the same way that Valjean is conditioned to look at convicts mm -hmm. as outside of society. Mm -hmm. But everything beyond that, though, I think Marius is arguing with him and saying, dude, stay here. We got We have room for you. And... I mean, I'm a little taken aback, but also the evidence of your life and the evidence of Cosette's report about you in the last nine years indicates that you are a man of faith and conviction. And he gives him permission to visit, even though he regrets doing it later. He does in the moment give yeah. Jean Valjean the permission to come and visit them. And yet, he says, Marius had been afraid. He knew too much already. He was trying to blind more than to enlighten himself. In desperation, he carried off Cosette in his arms, closing his eyes on Jean Valjean. I do not forgive him. <laughs> he's, he's residing in the heights of I idealism right now. He just came off of his of this ideal wedding, and now he's like being faced with reality, maybe even for the first time in this novel. He's really face-to-face -face with with reality mm -hmm. well i really hope he gets knocked off his happy little horse soon <laughs> i think it will probably turn out okay he's kind of on the same precipice that jean or javert was uh he's being invited to have all his ideas turned upside down and the question is if he can bear it too or like instead <laughs> Hmm. Okay, so Man. last thing, and I'm inviting you both to the absolute, to, to the height of your powers <laughs> in making fun of this author's portrayal of empty-headed womanhood. What do we make of Cosette's sticking your head into the scene? <laughs> well, as much as I'm embarrassed about being a woman whenever Cosette is on the scene... <laughs> <laughs> I also think that she's been given none of the necessary information to True. demonstrate qualities like Eponine did from the very beginning. She has been sheltered from reality so much that she is an unrealistic person. Mm -hmm. And Eponine was always, she was right in the heart of reality and it ate her alive, but she responded with the best of, of a woman's heart to you know, suffering and tragedy. And right. she reminded me in a lot of ways of Fontaine in facing tragedy. Mm -hmm. And there was like, I don't know. I don't think it's that Hugo doesn't understand women and doesn't have a, a positive read of womankind. It's just that Cosette is stunted. I think she's overly protected and stunted and hasn't been given a chance to really, I don't know, be, mm -hmm. be the best of a woman. That is she's idealized and she's unreal. And that's not fair. I think, Megan, you might have given me the most possible gracious reading of Cosette. Like, I feel like that might actually persuade me to not hate, hate her. her. <laughs> yeah. I know. She acts like an empty-headed ninny muggins. But think of the scene. She waltzes into the scene where the question is on the table that she really needs answered. And the men shoo her out of the room and then swear never to let her see who her father really is. That is so unfair. Right. You know? Yeah. Anyway, does she act like an idiot in the scene? Yes. Yes, she does. Am I embarrassed of her? Yes. But also, I wish they would just give her a chair and tell her the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do I. And I wonder what Hugo's going to do about it, because I'm torn, honestly. And bringing up Eponine and Fontaine, fine, and you might be right. But also, I'm not entirely sure that Hugo doesn't think it would be better to be Cosette. To be better to be idealized rather than real? 
Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I hope you're right. And I could see, I, I'd like to think that of him. Hopefully he does give us a, a fully real person in Cosette by the end in the next, you know, however many chapters. Right. I, I, I doubt it a little because mm -hmm. everything that happened to Fontaine and Eponine was the absolute epicenter of his tragedy. Right. Right. This is the tragedy of society. This is the tragedy of broken manhood exerting itself yeah. over broken womanhood. Right. He definitely wasn't saying it's see, see the good qualities in Eponine, see the good qualities mm -hmm. in Fontaine. Yeah. That wasn't his goal. Yeah. I do respect them more though. Was that on purpose? I don't know. That's a really good question. I have no idea because I do too. I mean, I agree with you. But then he also told us about Marius and Cosette and the fact of their wedding day being so joyous is that they had suffered. And I chuckled. Well, I chuckled too, because the theme, one of the main themes we've been tracing through this whole book is when you are at the lowest point, lowest point of society, lowest point of your life, the most intense suffering that you can experience. That is when you turn, you look left and the one with a capital O is standing next to you. Right. And Cosette, if she has been sheltered really truly from the depths of anything, then she does not know him. That I mean, that thematically follows. And she is the more to be pitied. Yeah. She suffered in her tiny, right. tiny youth. In her, in well, that's true. And Jean Valjean represented the one, the one. to her when Was he a Christ hand. figure. Yeah. Right. No, nope, you're I right. I forgot that scene. Her, but in as much as he's treated her since I agree. In her adulthood. You. Yeah. And I think that's kind of that. It's an artistic question. How is Hugo going to, or how might he present her knowing who Jean Valjean is? Is mm -hmm. she going to respond like she did that day? when the convicts marched by and she was so horrified she made John Valjean take her away or like will will she be um or will she take his hand like she did when she was a little kid and she wasn't scared of him you know and that's mm -hmm. what makes John Valjean's position understandable he's afraid to reveal himself to the most precious thing in his life because that could be the final word on him yeah mm -hmm. and he's been since the very beginning with the bishop he's been afraid of people's judgment of him hmm. yeah that's true and i yeah mm -hmm. well i'm scared i'm scared that the outcome depends on cosette you know what i mean yeah i'm so curious our next we're reading to the end next time i'm so curious how the conclusion goes I imagine it doesn't have anything to do with hordes of ghosts singing on heavenly <laughs> on the top of a barricade in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh, mm. Well, you guys, I'm so excited to get to the end of this trek with you. And you listeners, if you're still with us and you were here for episode one, our hats are off to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we are proud to have you. Our tricolored hats. For, that's right. Our tricornered hats are off to you. Um. <laughs> And yeah, let's, let's finish thing, this thing off strong. Um, what other episodes are we doing so that we can sort of prepare for those, Emily? <laughs> I love that you, you're asking that for yourself, not for I am. our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for our listeners too. I'm with Ian, yeah. Emily. I don't know. That's what are we funny. doing next? <laughs> um, well, we're doing the, uh, the reading, the last reading next time. Okay. After that, we're doing a whole book backwards perspective nice like we did for we're doing reading. a whole book backwards <laughs> we're, we're doing Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> we were done Oob. we're to reduce shakespeare company backwards. reference yeah we're gonna do it backwards but faster <laughs> <laughs> um yeah we're gonna do an overview of everything uh and last but not least we're gonna talk about the musical beautiful okay i have a couple of assignments for you are you ready you you okay. both must and i will do it too for the overview episode mm-hmm Choose the funniest line from your perspective in the whole novel. Oh my gosh. And the darkest moment. Whoa. All right. I got to write this down. Funniest line, darkest moment. And you listeners do the same thing and tell us what they are on Facebook. Fun. This is this is how we do overviews. I love it. <laughs> You've just decided this. <laughs> this is how we do overviews. I like this. We're not okay. going to summarize 2000 page novel. We are instead going to zoom in on moments. <laughs> the funniest line. I actually, I think I might know my funniest line already. That's fun. Okay. Off the top of my head. You can guess what character it's about. You guys, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you both for your insights and thank you listeners for your attention. And we will see you soon on how to eat an elephant. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Bon appetit.